starts playing. He starts singing. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is inside of you. The guy falls on the floor and then everybody sort of fit, like a fit. He's shaking. And next. I know it. That's why they brought me here. Oh my God. What am I going to do? Do anything now? That's fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Muslim means to worship God. To, you know, to allow your, your free will to be guided by the one that created you and put you here. So it took me several decades to find the purpose of life according to uh, what I, of course, uh, decided was the purpose of life after 11 years of research. Before that, I researched many, many isms and schisms and ologies. And I found them all to be lacking in certain areas. So, you know, I would find many people that were engaged in humanitarian works, which I really enjoyed, you know, trying to help humans live better lives. That's what I was, you know, before I became a Muslim. That's what I was engaged with. I spent a long time reading people like Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. All of you know Mahatma Gandhi, right? Popularized as in the, you know, by the media through Hollywood, you know. That's where I first saw him, actually, through Hollywood, the movie. And then I started reading into this man, because he seems a very sort of uh, chap, dedicated chap, you know, to humanitarian causes, and that's what I was upon. So kept reading and reading and reading. The only thing that I really didn't uh, sort of appreciate about him was his loincloth. But the rest of it, it was pretty cool. You know, he's a pretty cool individual. So anyway, he took on the Brits, didn't he? That's what I really liked about him. <laughs> it was a bad time someone took on the Brits, you know. And uh, um, anyway, so I moved on from Gandhi, really. I didn't really uh, understand what the purpose of, of life was from him. I spent several months with some uh, Buddhists, some Buddhists, as if you're American, Buddhists. Um, and uh, it was great. It was a great experience because they taught me how to meditate and taught me not, how not to drink coffee and tea and perhaps to be a vegetarian. So, and I went, I, I experienced that part of that. My, my life was extremely, uh, you know, exciting. Uh, the meditation was very beneficial. And then one day, I popped the question to the main emir, you see. So the emir came in. He was a white man like me, you see. <clears throat> and he said to me, you know, how's it going? And I said, well, what's the purpose of life before you get the answer? He said to me, well, the purpose of life. Hmm. So he was stirring his herbal tea, like you do when you're a Buddhist your herbal tea and make some for the people around you. And he said to me, to contemplate the supreme nothingness. The, sorry? The supreme nothingness. I said, well, I just wasted three months. <laughs> Why didn't I just ask you before I actually... Well, actually, the meditation was a benefit, you see? The Buddhist meditation was really beneficial. I used to do it in all sorts of strange places, sitting on the church from Godalming. You know where Godalming is? Yeah. You don't want to. <laughs> you know. So, anyway, spent lots and lots of time with them, and obviously they didn't really have the answer to my question. They gave me a book called The, Go the Golden Sutras, which is basically a dialogue between Buddha and a disciple. I couldn't get past page one. It was so complicated, I couldn't understand it. And I was thinking, well, if I can't understand it, then what about people who, you know, all the people who can't even understand reading and writing and, you know, who haven't got really much education? If they, I can't understand it, they can't understand it, then it can't be a universal message. So that was the last attempt I gave with Buddhism. Then several Moons later, I was walking through, uh, you know, Sussex University. So I'm walking through, and um, 
this young lady comes to me and says, come to our meeting. So I said, I would oblige and I would, you know, say yes to anyone once. You know, spiritually inclined, I thought, great, maybe I can find the purpose of life with these guys. So I'm sitting alongside them, having a good chat, and suddenly their attention turns away from me. <laughs> like we all need to be loved, right? And to this man who appears on the stage with a guitar in his hands. So he's got a rock guitar, and another guy comes with drums, starts playing, he starts singing, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is inside of you. It's a bit like that, but I can't sing. Um, and then, randomly, he just selects one person in the crowd, and he points to him, and he says, put the devils inside you, boy! <laughs> To him, he says, Put the devils inside you, boy! <laughs> Bit like that, Americanization. Yeah. So, there's me sitting at the back thinking, Oh dear, I'm next. I know it. That's why they brought me here. Oh my god! What am I gonna do? The guy falls on the floor and then ever sort of fit, like a fit, he's shaking. And then a group of people that, one of them who had invited me, grabs hold of him, and picks him up, and starts swaying him. Jesus loves you. Like this. A whole group of them. So I, I'm really, actually I'm quite freaked out by this. And I'm really, really not into staying around. So I edge my chair back, very slowly but surely. And I run <laughs> from the venue. And I never go back again. But guess what? It can be like that in some mosques, can't it? It's kind of like that in some of the mosques these days. Some crazy things going on. Don't go to India. If you want to know about Islam, don't go to India, yeah? Durga. Oh, they're frightening places, man. Hey, there I am. I'm run. Whew. Oh, that was close. About three, four days later. Because the, the serious note of, of, of this, or the serious... Uh, message that we're trying to get across by giving these stories is about the sheer desperation that a person will go to if he's you know seeking a path to his creator or her creator you know they go through stress they go through real difficulties on the way the way i describe it is like living in a dark room you know with a blindfold on with a blindfold on and you simply can't you're, you're on the chair with a blindfold on in the dark room but you can hear stuff going on outside and you can see small glimpses of light through the window but you can't move and you can't you don't know where the door is okay and this is the way I describe my own you know existence up until the fact that I found the you know uh, the Quran Three days later, I've been reading all sorts of uh, literature and I, I start to get into astronomy. And I start to, uh, you know, look at the night sky and investigate, you know, the heavenly bodies, the moon, the stars, the universe, the universes around me. And I start to think about the, wow, the astronomical distances and I start to feel very insignificant very subhanallah very uh, you know what's the word extremely uh, small and insignificant and I start to think look what has created this world whatever created this world must be absolutely magnificent compared to all the things that have ever been created and there must be a purpose. If there's not a purpose, it's stupid. The whole thing's stupid. I start to see, look, the tree. How many purposes does the tree have? Creating oxygen for us to breathe, right? A place for animals, for birds to live. 
beautification, shade, enriching the soil. You know, all of these amazing things a tree has, but a human doesn't have a purpose? How stupid is that? So I'm thinking to myself, and I'm looking at this universe, looking at these incredible structures and this beautiful design, this magnificence. Words can't describe it, and every night I'm just crying. So I'm there, I'm there in my room. I'm thinking, look, most of the people here are Christians. So let me go and find a serious Christian theologian and let me speak to him. So I knock on the door of a church on the Lewis Road. And this place is built on the same specifications of Noah's Ark. I don't know how they worked it out, but you know. So went in, the guy says to me, I'm sorry, I don't have time to answer your question right now. Now I'm popping the question to him, the most important question that humans have been asking since the beginning of civilization, right? What's the purpose of life? What on earth am I doing here? What am I doing on the earth? So he says to me, come back on Monday. <laughs> he makes me wait three days. I advise any Muslims, don't do that. Any people of any persuasion or faith engaged with people, if they ask you the question, then answer it to the best of your ability. So three days later, I went back. He was kind of busy anyway, but he managed to give a, you know, a window of opportunity for me to speak to him. And so he you know, says, so how can I help you? I said, well, look, see, I've got an issue. Um, what on earth am I doing on this planet? Who am I? Who is God? Why have I been created? What's my purpose? And I'm pouring my heart out. I'm about to cry. You know, because when you're like that, and you think you're right on the verge, maybe, of finding out what this mystery is all about. You see? And the guy says to me, hmm, after thinking for a bit, he says, have you ever thought about doing a theology degree? Look, you made me wait three days, mate. But you ain't making me wait four years. But that's how long it takes. <laughs> Trinity College, Dublin, I checked it all out. I decided against it because it was extremely dogmatic. It didn't seem to answer fundamental questions very, very easily. It seemed to make you want to have to learn a whole scientific language before it would tell you the basic thing. What are you doing here, man? I don't know. That's what he told me. I went out of that place pretty depressed. I can tell you that. I never went to the extent of considering taking my life or anything like that, but it got very close sometimes. So hundreds of conversations, hundreds of meetings with people of different persuasions and different religious backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds in different countries. I was in Pompeii. Pompeii was destroyed. By Mount Vesuvius, it was erupted. I was looking at what they were doing in Pompeii. Do you know what they were doing in Pompeii? Have you, who's been to Pompeii? What did you see in Pompeii? Just reflect. Allah says in the Quran, He says, Sir Firat, travel in the world. See what the condition of the people that came before you. They were stronger than you, they were mightier than you, but they are dust now. They're back to their creator. Massive civilizations, extremely sophisticated. But the activities in Pompeii, bestiality. You see, there was one street I went down just for people who want to have sex with dogs. Go to Pompeii and don't take my word for it. Why was Pompeii destroyed? Why? Why on earth? Why was it destroyed? Why did Mount Vesuvius cover it up and then allow people to see the condition of the people as they died? This was such a smackdown for me. You know, it was like, <gasps> that's serious. So the, all of these things and these incidents and these, uh, you know, the evidences that I was seeing were, were informing me of something higher power some greater essence, some greater power. 
after all of this, after all of these visits and so on and so forth and meetings, I was with, I was in the university and I was with, uh, you know, a girlfriend. She said to me, Tim, tomorrow, don't come here. So I said, well, so what sort of thing is that to say to somebody that you care about? He's got something to do with my religion, you see. He said, no, it's, it's to do with my religion. I said, look, religion or you, one of you is wrong. She got very angry and went in the morning to the ISOC. Like you do when you have a girlfriend who's a Muslim. So I knocked on the ISOC door. Like you do. Opened the door. A man, long beard, khutra, you know, Saudi style. Excuse me, I've got a problem with my girlfriend. <laughs> you will have if you don't get rid of her. So he says to me, well, she is no good for you. And you, you are no good for her. It's better you get rid of her. I said, you as well. She's kicked me out and you now, you're telling me to leave her as well. What is this? What sort of a religion is this? What is this religion anyway? Oh, Islam, you mean? Yeah, okay, read these. So he piles a pile of books like this. I remember the day, and it was two weeks later I'd read them all. I went back to the, I went back to the, uh, the girl, and I said to her, look, um, really sorry that if I cuss your religion, your religion's correct, you are the problem. <laughs> I said, why didn't you tell me about this religion and why were we doing these things, you know, together, being boy and girlfriend? Why didn't we just, like, get married? Why didn't you tell me? I would have even considered Islam. In fact, I'm quite convinced by Islam. Islam is really an amazing way. So I'd read all of this stuff and slowly but surely, I started to understand more and more. Now, what was the month month, Shah Ramadan, the month of the Quran, the month where that big devil shaitan is locked up. So slowly but surely I I'd, I'd found Islam and I would started to um, understand it and then towards the end of Ramadan one day I, I fasted one day and it was like somebody had taken me out of the dark room and removed my blindfold and shown me the rest of the world. And it's the first time I'd really seen the world. And it's the first time I'd really seen the world through the eyes of a believer and the eyes of somebody that really had, you know, well, just started to live. Fundamentally just started to live. Then I, uh, I kind of just kept washing myself because I'd read about the uh, ghusl and wudu. You know, ghusl, you know, baths and purification, so I was washing myself the whole night, you know, and I kept reading some Quran in English, <laughs> and then washing myself, really thinking I need to cleanse myself of all the stuff that I've done and thought and said in preparation for I don't know what, because <laughs> I didn't even know what I was doing really, but in the morning I ran out of the house and I found the first brown person with a white hat. Because <laughs> that's all I knew. Islam was brown people with white hats. So I said to him, excuse me, is there a mosque here? He said, oh yeah, just up there. So I walked into the mosque and this guy grabbed hold of my collars <laughs> at the uh, top of the stairs and said, you're mine. <laughs> you know, he could really see there was something peculiar about me, I'm sure. And he said, Brother Najib, his name was. He was Tabliki brother. You know Tabliki brother. MashaAllah. Big smile. Full of promises, man. MashaAllah. And he grabbed hold of me and said, What are you doing here? I said, I've come to accept Islam. And I need you to uh, go through the ropes with me. He said, well, what do you know about Islam? So I explained Islam to him because I've been reading. I probably met, read more about Islam than most Muslims do anyway. In that two weeks, you see. 
So I'd read through it, and I was totally convinced, and was ready to take the shahada. And then um, he says, took me up to the imam. And that was just after Fajr, in the last 10 days of Ramadan. So it was ram jammed. You know, the mosque was full. So I took the shahada, and um, just a small issue of about 300 men that hugged me. I had never been hugged <laughs> by a man up until that point. Even my father hadn't hugged me. So it was quite uh, an amazing experience, really. It was quite enjoyable, really. Um, I said, let's do some more hugging, you know. You know what it's like. It's kind of like a dance after a while, you know. You know, thousands and thousands of people. MashaAllah, great stuff. I have to say that the, 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 the family of Muslims that will, you know, effectively, you know, be able to help me to understand this life better.